Hello everyone. This is Ankur from Fin Study Club. Welcome to the you know the last study session which is study session 7 for CFA level 2 uh, you know for the financial reporting and analysis. Now you know this is a very very interesting uh, study session in the, in, the, in the sense that a it is very easy you know so uh, there is hardly anything which is very difficult uh, you know from an exam standpoint. So I'm writing the first word easy. The second thing that, that is peculiar about this study session is it is very very analytical. Okay. The third thing which is which I like the most is that it connects your level one concepts very well to the concepts of forecasting you know normalized earnings that you've learned in your equity level two. So this typically is basically the work that you shall perform as an analyst. So no wonder that CFA Institute has been pretty particular in asking a couple of questions you know from this. So this study session has got two readings basically uh, you know mm, some substance out of the two is common but I would like to treat them you know pretty separate. Uh, reading number 21 you know which talks more about the earnings quality and reading number 22 which is talking more about the uh, you know the the techniques of analysis which is basically you know the full case that they've taken and uh, you know they've analyzed different ratios out of that so so we will follow the same pedagogy pretty much you know um, they're the same sequence so overall you know if I put together I have about 25 slides and and, and I think that we should be you know uh, home in about 45 minutes so this is going to make great sense you know this is anyways going to make some sense but it's going to make great sense if you have a calculator with you because it's going to be uh, pretty hands-on number one um, you know you have let's say a printout of these uh, you know slides or at least you are able to make some notes that's going to be the best you know obviously my suggestion is after looking at this video just look at any book that you're referring to be uh, the CBOC or you know any other notes of you know Wiley or, or, or any any particular thing so that, that's going to take not more than 30 minutes to just scan through so what I've done is you know each paragraph from core book or you know different notes have been taken summarized and you know have present has been presented pictorially so so welcome again uh, to this study session 7 and I'm going to quickly start with the first of the readings here which is reading number 21 yeah, so here it is, reading number 21, which talks about the evaluation, evaluation of the quality of the financial reports. Now, this is something that you've already done in your level 1, you know, the last study session there also. And, uh, you know, therefore, you know, a lot of students uh, do not find this very, very challenging, which is rightly so. You know, a couple of points, so I'm also not going to spend a lot of time on this. A couple of points, you know, uh, need mention here is whenever we talk about the quality of the financial report we're talking about two aspects one the quality of the earnings and the second is how well is that earnings reported different aspects very very different aspects so the first aspect is very very measurement related how well has the business scenario been measured the second aspect is once measured how well has that been reported disclosures you know how detailed and how, you know what is the quality of all that so they are very very two different aspects you know obviously it's a matter of common sense that this will precede this obviously you know funds first you will have to measure the earnings well and only then you can talk about reporting that in, in, in a good sense well in terms of the earnings quality we're talking about two things one first is the quantity of earnings and second is the sustainability of earnings honestly speaking like you I was also a little surprised to find this quantity here and you know but rightly so in the, the context here is that when is earnings of good quality so Seabock has very well explained that earnings can be considered of good quality only when it earns sufficiently enough to cover the cost of capital in a way that your economic value addition should be a positive number because unless and until that happens the firm will always be under pressure to manipulate that you know and obviously because everyone would like to cover the cost of capital so that's like the basic hygiene factor that has been covered the second and a very very important aspect and a relatively more important aspect is the sustainability of it the earnings are said to be of good quality only when a fall or an increase either ways is sustainable 
if there is a one time element you know in in terms of the earnings then this clause gets defeated and therefore you have a, a non sustainable earnings coming out of that talking about the reporting quality you know as a second aspect i'm i'm going to, i'm going to come to this table which is you know very well captures all the scenarios but before that it's talking about the reporting quality like i said once the earnings have been correctly measured you got to talk about the disclosure of it and when will the disclosure be said to be of good quality when it helps in decision making you know sometimes you have a lot of us so i'm taking a very random example from pensions your pension assets are 100 and your pension liabilities are for example 99 this is a much more decision oriented scenario compared to just this so plan assets net plus 1 Okay, so if an accountant shows like this, you know, then the reporting quality is not said to be like of good quality. Okay, now obviously, under different standards, under US GAAP versus IFRS, sometimes a particular disclosure mandate is given. So, for example, in this context, the pension an uh, accountant is always told to you know report the net pension assets like this, but the disclosure that are required in notes to accounts. are fairly detailed there is a reconciliation of pbo there is a reconciliation of plan assets if that is not given and an accountant just mentions plan asset plus 1 then obviously in terms of the reporting quality it is fairly bad okay coming to this particular scenario of the table here this table very well captures the four scenarios that are possible which are the earnings quality high or low and the reporting quality high or low now this is a matter more of common sense that if the earnings quality is high then the firm obviously will not be motivated for a bad you know type of disclosure you know let me just explain you know the earnings quality if high that means there is absolutely a bona fide intention and in terms of low quality there is a malafide intention on part of the accountant not to show few things So point I was driving home is if the accountant is bold enough to report and sorry to measure the earnings well there is very less chance or virtually no chance that he will be you know um, not showing it properly so this particular scenario is you know is what we practically say doesn't exist the first scenario let me just name the quadrants 3 and 4 so the first quadrant is obviously the best scenario that an analyst would like to be and let me name some companies in forces or let's say apple so these are the companies uh, which are obviously you know strong enough to have only the sustainable part of the earnings without any manipulation as such and report them you know in in absolutely decision oriented manner but what is of interest you know to this audience which is you and to the speaker which is me is this quadrant number 2 and quadrant number 3 quadrant number 3 is easy to understand honestly and the moment i am going to put a name satyam stroke enron it will automatically be clear what does quadrant number 3 trying to say neither the earnings have been measured well the policies etc that they have used you know to calculate the earnings are very very wrong and at the same time the disclosure of that also has not been you know in in terms of a ball of white thing so there is a lot of malice you know while reporting hence we call it a fraud scenario what is very interesting is this particular quadrant okay it has got a very unique characteristic that the earnings are of low quality which means they are not sustainable or there is something which should not have been but the firm has been very transparent in disclosing that let me give you a scenario um company a needs to supply to company b who will finally supply to company c so that's how you know the chain works now the order let's say is of 100 units some reason restricted a from supplying to b but that doesn't mean that the b will not honor c's commitment there is always some kind of a reserve stock in opening stock which b can utilize now imagine b was following something called as lifo and obviously it's a 20 year old firm so in case of lifo the closing inventory as you are aware is always at the earlier prices so therefore the opening stock must be coming at 20 year old prices the moment those units are sold to c in the current year the cogs gets billed at these prices which are extremely low so there is a one off jump in the profit 
which you and I know as lethal liquidation. Now this is something which is non-sustainable. Hence, in terms of the quality, earnings have been pretty bad. But that doesn't mean that the firm is doing it, you know, intentionally. There is a possibility that the firm, in good intention, report that for the benefit of the analyst, gives you the fall or let's say the rise in the lethal reserve, as the case may be. Obviously, in this case, will be a fall in lethal reserve for the use of the analyst and he can you know make a suitable adjustment accordingly so this is particularly a scenario where the earnings quality is good whereas you know the reporting quality being bad so that brings me to a very similar table considering uh, now you have understood the different levels of reporting and earnings quality i'm going to put one here and two here signifying that earnings quality will proceed you know the aspects will precede the reporting quality so this first scenario is clearly the best scenario that you would like to get into and that is your first quadrant that we are talking here the last scenario which is both of them are bad is basically uh, this quadrant which you know we have numbered quadrant number three and you know the rest second third and fourth are basically the you know gray matter between the white and the black wherein the earnings quality will turn bad but it is still remain decision useful that means the firm is still bona fidely explaining you know the scenarios etc to the analyst in the third and the fourth now the firm has also started to deteriorate its reporting quality so you know this again like you know turning towards a worse scenario so moving to uh, you know the next point which is you know considering the two broad problems of quality of financial reporting the first and a very very easily understood is the timing issue the second one is also you know pretty simple to understand is the classification issue the first the timing issue is basically the shifting of an income or an expense between time periods okay we are not changing the nature of it but we are just, what i am saying is we are considering operating as operating considering non-operating as non-operating but we are just shifting between the two uh, aspects and one of the very very easy way of doing things is capitalizing versus expensing now if if any firm wants to reduce its profits of the current year rather than capitalizing they will prefer expensing if a firm wants to do uh, just the opposite of it, so they will prefer capitalizing. So, you know, obviously, uh, this is a very, very important line that I want you to read through. That the different combinations resorted to by different companies are as per the different situations. There is no one size that fits all, you know, kind of a scenario. I mean, uh, if less a firm wants to increase the profit, you know, in, in the current year then they would do something else compared to a firm who wants to increase the profit let's say in the next year so you know there is a lot of you know permutation combination that the firm has to apply same is the concept with cash versus accrual you know if the firm wants to postpone the profits for some reason then the sales that the firm has made you know even the cash has been collected they will show that as unearned revenue a is equal to L plus C. So cash coming up will not be taken to P and L, but will be shown as unearned revenue. Okay, in the current year and in the next year, this unearned revenue will translate itself into the P and L. Okay, so on and so forth. So there are a lot of you know these things. The same thing could be done in terms of expenses as well. If the firm wants to uh, reduce the current year's profit, even if the firm would have prepaid rent for the next three years they will not show it as prepaid rent but show the rent as the current year itself so obviously the analyst which has the access the window for an analyst is only the annual report you know these minor details will not be possible you know for him to catch the second and a very easily understood is a classification issue wherein we are talking about that if the firm wants to increase his operating income then they would like to classify non-operating into operating and they want to classify operating expenses into non-operating expense now again like i said different combinations will matter if the firm wants to avoid a merger and acquisition bid by becoming unattractive they would like to push down their ebit how would they do that the non-operating 
expenses will be included in operating aspects and some of the operating incomes will be taken out and will be shown as non operating so obviously com combination of that will pull the ebit down okay so these are like the two small problems very very really easily understood now a small note on the biased accounting now what is a biased accounting actually a uh, biased accounting is basically this combination that you know we have been talking about where the earnings quality is anyways turned bad but the reporting quality is just to being compliant what i mean by just being compliant is that it is it is not violating any standard us gap or ifrs but it is still not decision useful okay just a small note on that here in what basically we are trying to say that the accounting rules have been complied we are not violating any principles but the estimates or the principles that we have chosen are basically to convey a particular picture which is obviously not the correct picture scenario of the business what i mean by that an it equipment let's say a projector you and i have been you know mature enough to understand that a projector cannot have a life of 20 years or maybe even 10 years is overestimate but if a particular company really wants to reduce his expenses of the current year or let's say over a period of time they want to lower expense so they will increase the life of the projector to 10 years so in a way the accounting rule have been complied they are following straight line method and they are rightly calculating the depreciation but the fact of the matter here is that the estimates of life that they have chosen in context of the asset and the business is really not the correct picture Okay, this is forcing the analyst to believe in something that doesn't exist by taking the incorrect accounting policies. Okay, the question is, this bias can be spread over what all aspects? The bias, the answer to that is, can be spread over income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. Your income statement could be biased, your balance sheet could be biased. You know, between the operating versus non-operating assets, etc. You can still, you know, make some manipulations. and cash flows you know you can take something out of cfo and show in cfi vice versa and all that stuff so so all the things can be biased stroke manipulated and does the analyst have any way to kind of find this bias answer is a big yes you have so many things as an analyst that you can use to find out if the income statement balance sheet and cash flows have been biased now a simple point here and as a tip you know i i can give you uh, you know being my uh, being my dear students and analyst is that anything that you do here is not conclusive everything is suggestive what i mean by suggestive if there is some kind of a convergence uh, sorry uh, if there is some kind of divergence happening with the peers or industry average then it not necessarily will mean that there is a fraud in the company let me take an example um mm, the gross profit margin of my subject matter company is 10% whereas the industry average is about 18% okay that clearly tells me that there is some bias on the income statement because you can't really be you know at a gp level you can't really divert so much but there might be a particular scenario because of which this truly is true now the fact of the matter is that's where the reporting quality comes into picture your earning quality is obviously appearing to be bad but the reporting quality can play a pivot role if the company is transparent enough they will explain you the reason for this okay similarly uh, this is the cross sectional analysis the one that we talked about you can also have the case of time series analysis where the company's fundamentals is compared to the previous year's fundamentals there is a lot of interrelationship of ratios that you can establish you know the typical actions like creation of special purpose vehicle uh, one of the most famous ways of manipulating the balance sheet you know if let's say there is large fluctuations every year then again that is going to sound out so point i'm saying is these are all a common sensical approach b not an exhaustive approach c you know suggestive approach to find out if there is a bias in the uh, you know the balance sheet cash flow or or pnl or not so coming on to one of the most interesting aspect of this reading uh, which is the quantitative models to detect biasness now let me give you a quick context of who created these models and how did these things come into existence well honestly speaking if you and i go to meet warren buffet and ask as to Mr Buffet when do you consider a company being manipulative so he is going to give us his thoughts 
let's say four or five basic points so so let's say he's going to say the management quality has to be good he's going to say let's say the working capital ratio has to be something something he's going to say like your yeah, fixed asset turnover so all i'm trying to say is he as a individual will have some notions according to which he makes his judgment so here are two models created by such gentlemen who according to their thought process considered the biasness in different companies so please try and understand these two models are not the only models in the world number one number two they are absolutely suggestive you know they need to be taken or should i say they need to be understood directionally you don't have to mug up these models you have to really appreciate you know and get a sense of what they're trying to say okay um, different components and variables in this should also be you know pretty much clearly understood so 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 my forthcoming couple of slides are based on thought process of different individuals so there was one such model called as binish model which tried to talk about something called as an m score now it doesn't really matter if it's an m score or an n score or a p score it you know it's it is the output basically okay and this output is based upon eight different ratios your dsri your gmi let's say gross margin index you know asset quality index so on so forth mm, depreciation index you know selling general and administrative index accruals leverage all that stuff so point i am driving home is this gentleman thought that the biasness could be understood based on these eight variables okay now obviously if you and i you know uh, start arguing on it theoretically we can always come out with the ninth variable or we might reduce this to seven variables now it's so let's not get into all that let's try and understand what is he saying is basically trying to say is that he's saying that in the current year by looking at the previous year's figure you can find out whether the biasness has cropped in the current year or not so basically he's trying to say is that every year the situation has to improve or has to remain stable if it starts to deteriorate then you can assume that there is a biasness in the system and the model that he created obviously would have used a lot of regression and all that stuff the greater the score the worse it is for the company so the company is a good company like infosys will have a very low score in that sense okay that's how you know you got to remember this binish model as let's try and understand what does this dsri means it's like days of sales Re receivable index dsri is basically a negative number what i what i mean by dsri being a negative number um previous year Eight days was the receivable, and in the current year, let's say ten days have been the average collection period. So obviously the situation has worsened. Now, since this DSR is basically a negative parameter, the index that Binish has tried to create over it is to have the current year figure over the previous year. So which is ten day upon eight day. This is going to give me a greater number, and Binish says greater. the worse so you know higher the ratio the worse it is so that's how you know uh, the binish has created i'm talking basically about this slide which is the genesis of the entire slide now uh, this particular bullet which is the genesis of the entire slide says some index will have you know the current year's figure in numerator and some will have the previous year's figure in numerator now the key is for a candidate to understand how has it been constructed Now again saying I'm again saying that you don't have to ratify or remember all that but you just have to appreciate and understand that okay let's take another positive index which is a gross margin index now gross margin if it is 18 in the last year and 20 in the current year this is a positive thing higher the worse so therefore the way this time he will do is he will try and create the current year performance in the denominator because higher you know the worse which means if the previous year's one was higher then means it is you know bad situ situation for the uh, company okay so the formula that we are choosing has got two things here one is the you know uh, let's say uh, sga selling general and administrative expense okay but you got to understand higher the worse but here there is a negative sign okay so compared to dsr where there was a positive thing a negative 
ratio with a positive sign and a negative ratio with a negative sign are just opposite to each, each other okay so just just read through your core book and you will be you know easily comfortable to find out where you will have to use the current year in the numerator and where not so let me if i let's say uh, you know let me exemplify that uh, in case of you know days of sales receivable the figures that he would have used is current year over previous year because he, there is a positive sign but in case of SGA he would have still used previous year over current year because there is a negative sign that he has attached to it okay just go and read out your core books or, or the books that you're referring to it will, be, it will be very very easy just just try and understand that every such thing is an index an index has an NR and a DR so so DSR of one year paired with DSR of another year okay this is you know how the structure has been created as okay so like I said Binish talks about the eight different ratios uh, higher the ratio the worse it is compare that with another model called Altman model where the outcome is a Z score Altman basically use five different ratios all of the current year so there is no comparison with the previous year okay this is something that you got to remember the second aspect that you got to remember here is that obviously you don't, don't need to remember all five ratios but you got to remember that all the ratios the denominator is common which is the total asset okay another very very important aspect and the most differentiating aspect from Binish is the fact that higher the ratio the better it is okay so here Altman basically tried to link things like working capital you know net profit margin sales to total assets so basically trying to decompose the firm's performance into different aspects okay pretty straightforward pretty interesting you know these models are so let's talk about a slide which is pretty relevant you know uh, in the current context and I'm going to come back to this slide in my next reading as well so this is you know pretty much upfront communicated to you as well uh, well the slide basically talks about that every earning the quantity of every earning let's say it is dollar hundred pat of PAT will have some component coming out of the cash transactions what I mean by that it is the cash sales it is the cash expenses it is the other cash incomes okay now obviously you are aware that an income statement is created out of the accrual component and uh, you know accrual component here has been further divided into two aspects I'm going to come to that a little later but fact of the matter is that the idea is that this hundred dollar of pad should be divided between the cash component versus the accrual component this component is something which needs to be discounted by the analyst what I'm trying to say is that this is the place which is open for manipulation I am not saying that it has been manipulated for sure but all I'm trying to say is that there are chances that it might be and hence a lower weight needs to be given to this particular component so if a particular company is showing hundred dollars out of which eighty dollars are coming as accrual this is still a worst case scenario compared to a company which is let's say mm, showing ninety five dollars uh, and which is showing only ten percent coming from accrual so accrual portion is really something that as an analyst is a matter of worry for me now between this accrual you can divide that into two aspect there is something that is you know obviously very very normal accrual thing uh, let me give an example for that you're operating in an industry where two month credit is you know is a general norm so obviously as a player of the same industry you got to give that credit so this is normal accrual sometimes it's also called as non discretionary it is not on your choice that you can alter this you know obviously as an industry player you will have to follow some of the industry norms so this is still a lower problem for me what is a greater problem for me is something called as a discretionary accrual if let's say the company needs to really push the business they might start giving a three month you know credit period so the delta of one month credit which is given by the firm uh, you know is something which might indicate scope of manipulation okay so there is a very very important aspect called CFO to net income ratio which is the you know cash aspect divided by the accrual aspect so overall this number should preferably uh, not be less than one all throughout the life of the company there should be some variability it should not be consistently declining you know it should remain flattish you know over a period of time and obviously like mean reversion over a long period it should remain equal to one okay
Yeah, so moving to the next slide, uh, which is basically on the different examples of earning manipulation. Not a very difficult slide to understand, uh, you know, at this stage of your preparation. It is basically trying to say that your PAT could be manipulated in two ways. One is the revenue side, the other one is the expense side. And honestly speaking, we have talked about most of the things, which is like the classification issue, which is the difference, uh, you know, uh, you know, let's say between operating versus non-operating. And on the other hand, which is the timing issue, which is, you know, obviously capitalizing versus accrual. And we also talked about cash versus accrual here. The other aspect that, you know, uh, is like a delta or the incremental value add for you at this slide is how do you manipulate your revenue you know obviously one is something that we've already covered that if someone has to increase the ebit you know then they will take out the expenses from operating and put in the incomes into operating so you know, these are certain conditions that we have you know already talked about but these are the three new aspects that you got to understand and this is please understand it up front that these are non-sustainable increase in the sales which cannot be you know carried forward from year to year basis you can really do this as a short term measure but over a period of time if an analyst find out that any of the three method has been resorted you know by the company and therefore the revenue is jacked up hence i'm going to call this earnings as not of good quality what are these channel stuffing? Channel stuffing is a typical example where a company, let's say, uh, you know, let's say like Apple, who sells its products, you know, through distributors, distributor A, distributor B and C, and finally comes the consumer. Now, this company wants to increase his sales. So rather than ensuring and, you know, uh, kind of looking at the entire value chain, Apple really stuffs, stuffed up the channel to his distributor. So this is like wholesale and this part is the retail. So ideally speaking, wholesale should be a function of retail. You should not make your dealers very, very inventory heavy. But sometimes a company in order to manipulate certain issues at their end might want to really stuff the distribution channel in that way. So this is something, you know, it's obviously one time because the distributor might not have the capacity to absorb this kind of an inventory risk at their end. The second is bill and hold. Now this is resorted to when the distributors really kind of, you know, raise their hands up and they say, oh, sorry, sir, we'll not be able to take any more inventory. So what Apple does is they pass on the adjustment for credit sales. Obviously it's a bogus credit sale. They build the, you know, uh, product, but hold it with them. So this is clearly a bogus sale because if the sales have been done, my revenue recognition principle says that the ownership must be transferred, the risk and reward should be transferred, but you are still holding it. Therefore, you are still holding the inventory and its risk. That means it is still not in substance. It is still not a sale. So this is you know, something that uh, is resorted to when even the distributor stop taking any more, you know, channel stuffing from them. And the third is, you know, of course, is, is you know, a distress signal where huge discounting is done let's say discounting equivalent to 70 percent now obviously this 70 percent will artificially create a demand and an interest in the firm's product but obviously this is a huge selling expense that the firm cannot sustain so uh, you know any of the three if if an analyst see that the sales are increased because of any of the three things then obviously you know you can conclude that the earnings are you know manipulated but how would you find those things out that's another question well, again, these are the tools which are available, you know, very commonsensical. You got to do the historical analysis. You got to do the cross functional analysis, you know, comparison with the peers. You got to look at the cash versus accrual aspects. If someone sees that your unearned revenue is increasing considerably year after year, that means there is something incorrect with that. Okay. In some cases, the analyst may want to check the physical data, you know, if obviously given a chance, because otherwise companies will not allow the analyst, etc. to kind of check their physical stocks. But if given a chance, they should always look at that. Imagine a stockyard where this much space is taken by one car. And you can imagine there are, let's say, only 20 cars that can be parked in this particular stockyard. But the balance sheet says that there are 200 cars being parked. So obviously, you know, you can make a sense that compared to the physical space, you know, the number that is being shown is not correct. So you know, there is something that you can find out in, in, in that case. And obviously the related party scanning is something that, you know, you have to be in any ways worried about, you know, as far as this particular you know, case is concerned. 
So moving to the last slide of this reading, fairly simple. So where can an analyst find the risk related to the company? Now, obviously, you know, annual report is one of the biggest source and therein, you know, you have different components like financial statements, the auditor reports, the notes to financial statements, management disclosure and analysis. I mean, these are all the commonsensical reading that must be done by the analyst in order to you know analyze a company qualitatively very very important aspect from you know the analyst standpoint and obviously you know you have some other details like you know sec forms nt you know your newspaper magazines media credit rating agencies etc etc so you know all in all you know pretty simple uh, and you know uh, qualitative reading this was you know reading number 21 i hope that you know you guys have enjoyed so i'm going to you know um, uh, looking forward to speak to you in my forthcoming session on reading number 22 which is equally interesting again a very very short thing but it will involve a little more you know calculation aspect so uh, talk to you soon then this was Ankur from fin study club you know uh, have a great exam thanks